nobody can be like a master of every trade. Nobody can like know everything about everything. And having the humility to say, you know what? Like I am not an expert in this. Let me help you find someone who is. Like that is what makes a good healthcare provider. Welcome to Peds Doc Talk TV and this episode of the Peds Doc Talk podcast where you can catch my amazing conversations with guests on the show here on my YouTube channel or if you prefer audio only, wherever you access podcasts. I'm Dr. Mona Amin, a board certified pediatrician, lactation consultant, and mom of two, and I'm here to uplift, support, and guide you so you can raise those incredible kids. Let's get to today's amazing conversation. Today, I welcome fellow pediatrician and mom, Dr. Krupa Playforth, who is on social media as at the Pediatrician Mom and owner of her own practice, Warm Heart Pediatrics. And she's joining me to chat about pediatricians, why we say the things that they we say, and also misconceptions we commonly hear about pediatricians on social media. Thanks for joining me today, Dr. Krupa. I'm so excited that we are connecting. <laughs> me too. I feel like, you know, obviously I know you, even though I don't know you because of social <laughs> media. So this was a long time coming. Um, thank you. And I, I know we're going to get into a lot of things that we hear in our practice, but also online. But before we get into all of that goodness, tell us more about yourself um, and also including maybe why you started Warm Heart Pediatrics. Yeah, so um, I uh, grew up in Malawi in Central Africa, which is also called the Warm Heart of Africa. Um, and so many, many years ago, I had this dream of opening a practice and I bought the domain name Warm Heart Pediatrics without any idea of how it was going to happen. Um, and then I worked in a standard practice for many years, um, created the pediatrician mom and got really into like writing and creating content. Um, but I was practicing and it just never felt right. It never felt mm -hmm. like I was able to provide the type of care I wanted to provide. So I jumped the gun. I took a little hiatus and created the practice that I would like to bring my kids to. Oh, I love it. I am in that five-year plan, by the way. And I know <laughs> I've talked to you about that. Like I, I love Pete's Doc Talk. I love my platform, but in terms of in-person clinical medicine, their dream is to have my own practice too. So you are my, my dream, my inspiration on that standpoint, <laughs> because I want that as well to re- or to basically rewrite what we want pediatric medicine to be, which is what you're doing. So love that. Um, of course, I'll be linking the resources. You're local to obviously a community, but you also have your own online platform as well. Um, and so to, to start off, you know, Dr. Playforth and I, we're going to be talking about a lot of things that we hear about pediatricians. We don't love it. Maybe we do. And we're not going to be able to represent all pediatricians. You know, we both have social media platforms. I know this, but we wanted to just address issues and talk about it as two pediatrician moms. So remember that before we get into that conversation. So we asked our followers what they may be frustrated with when it comes to visits and also what they've heard online about pediatricians, you know, and here's some of them. I'm just going to really briefly talk and then we're going to dive into it the way we approach sleep, that we have no education on lactation, that they make money if they vaccinate our kids, that they have outdated feeding advice, that they don't have any training on neurodiversity. Why won't they refer my kid? They don't know about car seats. They don't know about childhood development. Okay, there's like a lot of things that we don't know that I'm hearing um, <laughs> online and from people. So let's start off with being honest. And I love that we're talking about this because I will be honest, you're going to be honest. Mm -hmm. Again, we can't speak for every pediatrician, but we can speak for ourselves. Let's talk about lactation education first. What do you think people should know about pediatricians and their knowledge of lactation education and how to approach it? I think that this criticism is actually pretty valid. You know, um, I got no lactation uh, education as a resident, which sounds just when you think about that as, as yeah. like what that is, that sounds crazy, right? Like you should be able to you know, troubleshoot and do at least the basics, but I had no education. My own lactation education came from trying to breastfeed three children yeah. and not succeeding at it. And just like the, the sort of trauma of that actually led me to start, I'm, I'm working on getting a lactation certification, but Ooh. pediatricians <laughs> have to do that independently. They have to decide that that's something they want. And not everybody has the resources or the time or the ability to do that. I agree. I, 100% agree with this one. Um, it's why I also went to get my IBCLC, and I love that you're doing that as well. I think it's going to be such a huge resource for your patients. But yes, this is definitely real. So when people say yeah. your, your pediatrician did not get enough training on lactation education, I agree. And I will also add that 
just reading about it. Like, so there's so many things that we can do and we'll get into that you can educate yourself by reading books because you mm -hmm. have a foundation. You cannot read yourself into knowing lactation education no. un unless you are a CLC, IBCLC. And even then you have to practice it, right? You have to see the patients, work with the families, talk about it, see the issues. So it is more than just brushing up on knowledge, yeah. in my opinion, um, in this yeah. category, for sure. Uh, and I think it's valid. I think, um, you know, there's, we'll get into the next one, which is car seat education too. And I, <laughs> that's why, that's why there's professionals for that. But yeah, I think any new parent, I say, Hey, look, you're, I can, I provide a lot of resources on my platform, but one thing until I became an IBCLC is that I cannot give you the most optimal lactation education. And even so, I think when you finally get into it and get your training, I think you're going to also find your niche. You know, I, I have found my niche to be pumping, combo feeding education. That's something that I feel like I'm good at. Whereas mm -hmm. direct feeding to the breast, I'm not as good at in educating as maybe some other colleagues. So it's kind of yeah. like how we know with pediatrics, knowing our strengths and weaknesses, even as pediatricians, I think you're also going to find your niche and your strengths. Um, and I think that's beauty in that as well. I do think that one of the benefits of being a pediatrician who does get lactation education that you don't always get from somebody who only has the lactation education is that um, you can kind of look at the whole clinical picture. Yes. I find that a lot of, you know, accounts and, and lactation providers are fantastic about this, but a lot also are very one note and they don't necessarily balance the, the mental health of the parent, the mental health of the family, like all the different contextual things that are going on. And a pediatrician who can do that would be really helpful. Well, exactly. And that's why I think it's a gold mine when there's a physician, a pediatrician, mom, especially a pediatrician mm -hmm. mom, because you may have gone through that personal yeah. experience, whether it was being successful, quote unquote, with breastfeeding or not. So you mm -hmm. can add the personal, but also that, yes, the development, sleep education and the sleep understanding that we get. But also, like you said, the whole picture. I mm -hmm. completely agree because when I agree with people saying online that your pediatrician doesn't have any education on lactation education, but those same people tend to bash us mm -hmm. in uh, other aspects too. When yeah. if you are trained in it, you are going to be this gold mine of being able to provide this holistic approach to newborn feeding. How does it impact maternal mental health? How does mm -hmm. it impact sleep? How does it impact everything that we're doing in those first four months when breastfeeding is really the hardest? So I, I love yeah. that. And I agree with that completely. I'm excited for you that you're going to be able to get that. Like, I'm so like, it's going to be great. I I'm can't wait to get to it. Do, yeah. like home visits with lactation, yes. which I think would be like gold, right? Like as yes. a parent, I would have loved that. I, I think it's, and that's my dream. You know, that's why I became, I did it and it was hard. I mean, you, the amount of hours and the, mm -hmm. the coursework, but exactly like, you know, being able to either in your office with the time that we have. And I think yeah. going into that, even now, even though I have my IBCLC, I've spoken to my, my corporate medicine practice um, and they don't allow me time. They say, oh, well, you know, you would have to, you know, we have lactation consultants that do that. I'm like, give me the hour mm -hmm. with my families. Let me yeah. build that, build that. And so what I'm doing is I'm basically giving, sadly, my half-ass lactation education yeah. advice because I don't have the time. And so I'm building all of this because I want to start my own practice one day like you, but I love that you're doing that. Um, and segueing to the next topic that I already alluded to, which is car seat education. <laughs> yeah. What do you know? Do we know a lot? Should we be the experts? Are we the experts? Should we be the experts? I don't think we should be the experts. I think that it's important for people who have expertise in something like that because it is safety related, yes. right? I mean, we should know basics. We should know what the guidelines are, but, um, but it's nobody can be like a master of every trade. Nobody yes. can like know everything about everything and having the humility to say, you know what? Like, I am not an expert in this. Let me help you find someone who is like that is what makes a good healthcare provider. I agree. And don't you feel, I feel this. I, I, I love you. And this is why I follow you. I feel that a lot of times co our colleagues, pediatrician colleagues tend to get this because of our training and because of maybe how it was fed to us that they tend to put the ego and mm -hmm. in the front, in the front seat versus what you're describing, which I completely agree with knowing limitations and then, or they're not willing to look at other perspective or the other mm -hmm. side of something yeah. and say, 
I'm not the expert. I agree with yeah. you, Krupa. I don't know how, like installing a car seat. If you came to me in my office and said, Dr. Mona, can you help me install this car seat? I'm going to be like, no, I mm -hmm. want you to get a child passenger safety technician to help you. Here's some resources I can provide. And then I give, you know, my favorite online resources that like, like we know, but you're right. We're not masters at everything, but some of us, maybe there's a, there's a pediatrician out there that has took extra education to become a car car seat passenger yeah, safety tech also. probably is. Yep. Yeah. Similar to like how me and you are, you know, in that lactation education world that then, yeah, there's nuance to that. But to say blanket statements that like, okay, your pediatrician doesn't know anything. Well, there probably is some pediatricians that know, but you're right. We are not experts in installation. But mm -hmm. what I do believe is that we should stay on top of the most recent safety yeah. guidelines, right? We like, should know the guidelines. Yeah. Like, hey, rear facing as long as possible. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be forward facing, let's discuss the, uh, the benefit and risk if you do that after two. I know sometimes I discuss forward facing with my children who may have um, really bad car sickness, yeah. like after mm -hmm. we've exhausted everything. And yeah. it's a balanced discussion. Like, yeah. it's not like, oh, you're a terrible parent for turning forward facing. It's, hey, look, rear facing is optimal. But I also know that your child's suffering really bad and you guys are cleaning up vomit every single day and you've tried other things. Let's try forward yeah. facing. And your and child's cleaning a your car soul. seat is like, yeah. for cleaning vomit out of a car seat, like the whole car is like smelly. Like, it's just like, you have to think about like, what is this poor family going through? Yes. The child and the whole family, right? And so going back to what you said about the lactation educators and like that whole picture approach, what I will always say is why I will always stand up for our profession is that if it's a good pediatrician like you or me that it has mm -hmm. humility, we're looking at the big picture, but we also know our limitations, but we are looking at the, the family unit. We're saying, is this affecting their joy? Is this not helping them? And if it is, I'm going to discuss with you the benefit and risk. And that is what I think is so important in that doctor patient family relationship, which you're providing as well, um, having your own practice now and having full control over it's the time so and narrative. I'm so, I'm so excited for you, but yeah, like, it's yeah, true. you don't always have time for that conversation, yeah. right? Like there is also a safety piece that if you are like, if your child's vomiting and you're turning around while driving, trying to see what's happening, like there's a safety piece there too. And like the only way to like tease out the balance, the risks and the benefits, like you're saying is to have that conversation, but most people do not have time. Um, yeah. And I do love that you talk about this as well. Um, I think that a lot of the pediatricians that do education on social media actually are trying to battle the same issue. And so a yes. lot of them actually are quite nuanced, but not everybody. And I think a lot of the people that are resistant to social media, it's the same thing. It's, it's like a, they're also resistant to any idea of change. There is a resistance yeah. to the concept of baby led feeding. They're, you know, resistant oh, yeah. to a lot of things. Oh, and I think that's kind of a good segue to talk about feeding, right? I mean, yeah. I, I know, and you know that a lot mm. of feeding advice is outdated. And we know that because we, me and you stay up to date, whether it's yeah. through our own knowledge or through social media, whatever it may be. But I have colleagues who are still anti baby led weaning, self feeding from a young age when I'm like, listen, I'm not saying that we're going to be unsafe here, but can we open our minds a little bit and mm -hmm. listen and see how beneficial it can be and provide the resources so a family can make safe choices, right? So, and a lot of the narrative we hear is pediatricians don't get any education on feeding solids or also nutrition. What is your perspective from your training? I can talk about mine and maybe just being a clinician for as long as you've had. I think that um, we do get training on some of the most important nutritional parameters, right? Like yes. iron, for example, and like the importance of making sure that your child is not getting uh, straight cow's milk uh, before the age of one. There, there are definitely some some things, but do we get education on how to cut food um, and for baby led feeding? No. And mm -hmm. I also have still have many many colleagues who have the attitude: look, we did purees before, we all turned out fine. So like, yeah. why would you change something? Um, but there are lots and lots of pros and cons to how how you approach introducing solids and just being willing to have the dialogue. Some people are just simply not. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Like, I, I mean, yeah. and it, it also relates to picky eating, right? Like there's a lot oh, yeah. of like ev evolving understanding of how to create a healthy relationship with food. And like that yeah. is a criticism I hear about, from, about pediatricians all the time. 
Well, early, you know, I recorded an episode with a pediatrician from India. He has over like 5 million followers on his social channels. Okay. He's a pediatrician. And we brought this up. I talked to him about how in India, culturally, spoon feeding your child is very common until they're basically mm-hmm. like 18 months and two yes. years. Okay. Yes. And he even admitted, he's like, Mona, I, I need you to educate my, my community about this. And I see the benefit. I mean, I, I'm not, again, I'm not pushing families to get out of their comfort zone too early. Like I'm not going to ever say anything that's not safe, but I also have done so much of my own research in my own time using reputable resources. I'll mention them here. Solid starts is one of the biggest resources that I, I give to all my families like, Hey, here's their first food, first food database. But also I I learned through their first food database about the cutting of the, of the Mm -hmm. item. So Mm -hmm. I never knew that. I didn't learn that in pediatric training because, but you chose to get, you chose to educate yourself. Like you took that time because it was important to you. Yes. And, and I think that's another thing that a lot of the things that we're going to discuss is also going to be your pediatrician, right? Your pediatrician's desire to want to learn Mm -hmm. that information. So for me, child development and the first seven years is really important. So I'm, I'm learning about sleep. I'm learning about feeding solids. I'm learning about child behavior, tantrums, managing all of that. I'm obviously lactation education because that's important to me. What's not important to me, and I'm going to be quite honest, I'm not going to do as much deep dive education into asthma. Not that I don't think asthma is important, but because I know I can't be the expert at everything. So I have to tell myself, okay, Mona, you really love talking about parenting, but because you love talking about parenting, you may not be able to know so much about asthma. So if you're not able to handle this asthma, you're going to need to refer this patient to either a clinician that knows asthma better than you or a pulmonologist that knows asthma better than Mm -hmm. you. And that's going back to the humility piece. But I think we do a huge disservice with our, a lot of colleagues who do not accept baby led weaning or the encouragement of learning more about baby led weaning Mm -hmm. and talking about, hey, what are your fears? You're afraid of choking. You're afraid of allergies because those are the two big fears I think parents have when they start solids. Let me talk to you about what, how to overcome these fears. Let me talk to you about how we can make this as safe as possible for your baby. Do you know how to handle a choking incident? Do you Mm -hmm. know what choking looks like versus gagging? And because we're pediatricians, we have so much power if we know that and also have the ability to educate families on all of that because we're the big we're the we're able to again going back to what you said we're able to look at the anxiety the mental health mm-hmm. piece we're able to look at how is this going to help the child's behavior and also nutritionally i know the basics too but i also know that if my child's struggling with some sort of pick very severe picky eating issue i'm really good at managing selective eating and picky eating but if it's getting really restrictive mm-hmm. nutritionist is coming into yeah. play feeding therapist is coming into play because like you said i know my limitations mm-hmm. yeah and you have the humility to say that and i my yeah. experience with patients and parents has been i think i think a lot of people fear that if they say you know what i don't know the answer to that People will be upset with them or frustrated with them. No. But my experience has been the opposite. Like parents appreciate when you're like, you know what? I don't know. Let me help you find out. Or yeah. like in the case that you just described, like the choking stuff, right? Like you could talk about the basics, but you're not going to, you're not the expert in CPR. You are not going to do CPR training, but you can say, these are the CPR resources in our community that I recommend. It, it is, oh gosh, yes, I love it. I love, I love this conversation already. <laughs> because going, because what, again, going back to what I was saying about social media and the perception people have on pediatricians, and it's a lot of times, a lot of accounts, you know, they are trying to sell their own courses or yeah. sell their own resources. So what they do to pitch themselves as an expert is say, your pediatrician has no training on mm-hmm. car seats, lactation, feeding solids. We'll get into this sleep. But I do. Yep. I, I, I mean, we're admitting, me and you are sitting here and admitting that we don't know everything, but it's mm-hmm. not okay with me for you to make us look inferior to sell yep. your stuff. It's almost yep. like me and you getting on our content and saying, we could do the same thing. And we don't. Right. We could. I know and we many don't. people. I know mm-hmm. many people who don't know a- enough about me, a- about the things that I know or the nuance that we know, but I'm not going to put you down to elevate myself. And so Mm-mm. that is where I get defensive, right? Where I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. I, I agree. I don't know a lot about this stuff, but what I don't agree with is that you're putting my profession and my colleagues down to elevate yourself, to seem like an expert when you can mm-hmm. do, you can show your expertise in other ways like me and you do. 
Just yeah. give the content. Show, don't tell. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because it's, yeah. it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> it, it like interferes with then your relationships with those specialists, you know, especially exactly. if it's something in your community. Like you want to be able to refer, you want to be able to contact them and say, look, I have this situation. Let's have a dialogue. Help me help them. Um, and yes. if you feel like you are going to be attacked, like that doesn't enable a dialogue and a sort of multidisciplinary approach, which is what parents need. That is what is lacking in today's healthcare. Everything is so specialized that like, you don't have somebody who's like doing the bird's eye view. And that is the goal. That's what the pediatrician should be doing. Now, systemically, can we do that? Like that's a yeah, whole other conversation, yeah. but, um, yeah. but like, that's the goal, right? Like we, yeah. we have expertise in the things that we have expertise on, but we also need the other professionals, but they also need us. Like they need our expertise too. It's a team effort. And so when you yeah. start, like you said, when you start to just denounce us and say, well, your, mm -hmm. your pediatrician's not an expert in X, although that's true. Now what you've done is you've put us down on a lower pedestal. And what that also does is for the consumer of that information, it makes them not trust their pediatrician for Which other so things dangerous. as well. So because, dangerous. Right. Like if they hear, like if I'm going to give an example, like if a car seat, edu I mean, car seat education. Absolutely. I am not an expert at <clears throat> car seat education. But if you say your pediatrician is not an expert, a person consuming that is going to say, yeah, my pediatrician doesn't know that. They also probably don't know anything else. But mm -hmm. you're extrapolating. I yeah. may not be an expert at everything, but I, I again, we know our limitations, but it can it can lead to mistrust in the pediatrician patient relationship. And not only in the fact that that person may need you, the pediatrician at some point too. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to be like, Oh, Hey, guess what? I actually said that y'all don't know anything, but I need you for this now. Like, it's not a good look. <laughs> and they all like, have the caveats of like, you know, yeah. Oh, if, if you, if our things are not working, then go contact your pediatrician. Yes. Right. right. Like right, right. that's, that is always there. Yeah. And it's funny because they have to put that because they're yeah. not medical experts. Exactly. And again, we are, we are the true we are the true holistic approach, right? When we start to yeah. look at, we took, we look at the issue in front of us, the health, the development and the safety of the child as a whole. Mm -hmm. Again, we may not be, we, we may not, we may not be experts at every single nuance thing, but we are looking at the whole and that's what we are. We're general yeah. pediatricians. We are the, let me see what I can help you with. Yeah. If not, I'm going to, I'm going to give you resources. I'm not yeah. going to leave. Hopefully, I'm not going to leave you hanging and we'll get into that. I know we have some advocacy uh, comments about that. Now, the next one is a big one, which is um, sleep. OK, so mm. there's many anti sleep training advocates that blanket us into the statement that we're not sleep experts. And many times parents are frustrated when their pediatrician asks them, "Where, you know, how is your child sleeping, mm -hmm. especially in those early months? I'm curious how you approach sleep conversations and also, what is your background? What did we learn? What did you learn in sleep for, about sleep in your training or maybe just through your experience as being a pediatrician? We did a little bit of education on sleep in my residency because um, we had a pediatric neurology rotation, but it was more on like really significant sleep disorders and not yes. so much on like what is like a normal developmental trajectory of sleep. And again, that's something that I learned on the job as a parent, <laughs> but yes. also in talking to um, and learning from my patients, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what kinds of issues are you running running into? And I, I now have a good sense of it, but it took many years to get there. I think the problem is that there's a lot of quote unquote experts on sleep out there that are uh, oftentimes bashing pediatricians yeah. but the sleep edu sleep um certifications and things like there's no standardization yeah and um you know they, they just have the time to have these conversations that we should be able to have but um i, I do think that with sleep there is also a little bit too much black and white thinking um, among yeah. the pediatrician community. Um, you know, oh, everybody should be able to sleep. Like, there's increased yes. recognition that there are neuro like there are situations, for example, in kids who are not neurotypical, where the sleep disorders are legitimate and like the normal things are not going to work, and you do have to think outside the box. But it could take a while to get to that point if you're only having like 15 minute conversations every few months or every year, right? I agree with this. I, you know, I, my, I like to say, share my background because again, it's, it may look different because yeah, we trained, yeah. we trained mm -hmm. differently. So in residency, because I had such a passion for general pediatrics, I started just doing my own reading about sleep and stuff like that, but it wasn't very heavy. And again, we learned sleep disorders like mm -hmm. sleep apnea, um, mm -hmm. you know, also 
also in my residency, we did learn about like neurodiversity and sleep issues because I did a I did a, a very deep dive into a developmental behavioral rotation because I thought I That's wanted to awesome. do. Yeah, because like I said, we, we all have different niches and my niche yeah. was development and behavior. I love mm-hmm. development and behavior. So in that rotation, which I did multiple rotations, I did a sub I, which, um, or not sub I, I apologize, an audition rotation, which for anyone who's not familiar is when you're um, go in medical school, you can kind of do these rotations even before you join residency. And I did many in pediatric, um, pediatric behavior rotations because I was such a passion for it. Yeah. But that being said, it's only a rotation. And then you go into residency. My real deep dive into sleep was when I, my first job, and I I've spoken about this before, but I worked for a practice called Tribeca Pediatrics. And people who listen to this practice are going to be like, whoa, because at Tribeca Pediatrics, the doctor that that created that practice and who I worked with, um, he talked about sleep training babies early at two months of age. Now, people listening are like, oh my gosh, that's not safe. That's not possible. It was very out there, right? Mm -hmm. And I joined the practice and I'm this new fresh doctor learning, (laughs) you know, consuming all of this information. And I saw all these families coming in, sleep training their babies at two months of age. And I'm like, huh, all these parents are telling me that it worked. Okay. They did crime methods of sleep training, by the way. And I'm like, this is interesting. This is not anything I've learned. So then I started deep diving. And then I started going into all the research we have, which we know in sleep research, even Mm -hmm. in infants, there's not a lot of research, right? Because either you're going to find holes either way, whether it's pro-sleep training, anti-sleep training, there's always some confounding variable because as we know with any parenting method, that there's a lot of variables, right? Well, what did how attuned is that family during the day? Is there check-ins? What's going on? It's not clear cut. So then I started to take that. And then also with my own experience being a mother, my own experience through the last nine, 10 years of practicing by my like, you know, out of residency and starting to see, does it always work? Yeah. Can it work? I moved to another practice and then I started to see, well, no, it's not always going to work. It depends on the family. It depends mm-hmm. on are there other children. So it's that understanding. I took what I saw, this very extreme viewpoint, and I said to myself, could it work? And I, I, a lot of my listeners know we sleep train Ryan at two and a half months with the crime method. And it worked for him. Oh, which for, is amazing. For Vera, for Vera, we didn't need to sleep train because I, I implemented a lot of strategies that I have learned through the 10 years of practicing and through a lot of reading. I mean, the amount of reading I've done to educate myself about sleep. I've not only read books that disagree with my opinion, but I've read books that agree with my opinion. Because we have to to. read both perspectives. And the frustrating thing about a lot of those accounts group, and I know you can agree, is that they're not reading my perspective. I'm Mm -hmm. sitting there reading about accounts that are talking about co-sleeping and what they're telling me about co-sleeping. And I'm listening. I'm saying, you know what? I can see that. And also because I have pediatrician colleagues, I have non-pediatrician colleagues that are in the medical field who've co-slept. I have friends who have co-slept. And so in my head, I'm looking at, can I get that there's risk to co-sleeping? I'm not denying that. And even the pediatrician doctor I talked to that, I, you know, the episode is going to go live. I, I, we spoke about that because co-sleeping mm-hmm. is very common in India. It's the norm. Yeah. And I, I asked him, I'm like, do you see safety risks? He's like, not when it's done correctly. And I said, thank you, because I need to learn this. Because in order to be better clinicians, we need to understand that every parent may have a different choice, right? And if I don't educate about the risks of co-sleeping, then that parent is going to do it unsafely. It's like abstinence-only education, right? Mm -hmm. If I say don't have sex versus let me teach you about why it's risky to not use protection, then that person is not ever going to learn, right? Like the risks. So I think the reason I get frustrated again with those accounts that tend to be polarized against pediatricians is that they tend to be co-sleeping accounts, right? Mm-hmm. Because in, in the AAP, we don't recommend co-sleeping because right. of the things that me and you have seen. I yeah. have seen children yeah. die from you unsafe practices. You never forget practices. that parent cry. You never forget, like, I still have nightmares about some of those babies. Yeah. And I mean, they're usually in the ER for us, right? Yep, Rotations yep, yep. or mm-hmm. or they were stories that we heard that we, we tend to get, we find out in our, in our clinic and we're yep. like, wow. And we don't, you know, we get the details that come out, whether it was, you know, the, and for me, most, most of them have been a parent who fell asleep on an armchair or a couch with their child on top of them. Right. Mm-hmm, and we mm-hmm. know that that is one of the more riskier behaviors versus, okay, 
in the bed, moving the pillows, all the things. But the problem that I see with sleep education out there is that it is very polarized. And even us, I think we as American pediatricians can do a better job listening to our colleagues in countries where sleep and bed sharing is more culturally common to learn more like, well, what are you telling your families? Like, what are you seeing? Because I see risks, but apparently this is the norm culturally, giving that example of the doctor I spoke to in India, yeah. what is it that is different? And so, you know, me and him had a really great conversation because we we, we wanted to learn from each other. Yeah. In India, they want to, they co-sleep until the kid is seven. And I'm like, listen, listen, <laughs> that's not, that's not what I'm about. And I, I, we had a funny, like really balanced discussion. I said, well, I do believe that there's benefit in teaching our child to sleep independently. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to love their caregiver, that there's no bond. But I understand what you're saying that in a house where there's six children and you can't buy five different cribs, mm -hmm. it ends up being that everyone's sleeping on the floor on a mattress. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I think we need to be more balanced, but I will not ever sit here and accept being demeaned by those accounts. You know, well, you, you also know that... didn't get defensive. That's the difference. Right. And I actually love this about your account. Like if people challenge you, you don't get defensive and right. aggressive and lash out. And you, you actually do have the humility to listen to a different perspective. Now you may not end up agreeing with them and that's fine, but yeah. just being willing to have the conversation rather than shutting it down because you know what, like I, I, this is like disagrees with my view. So no. Right. And I, and I think, you know, I'll be honest, I've, un, I'm going to be, I don't know if people know this, I've unfollowed a lot of pediatricians Me on too. social media because they are very polarized in the way they communicate. There was one, and I'm not going to name names, that basically said, here are three things that I would never do as a pediatrician. I would never bed share. I get it. I, I, I personally don't want to bed share. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I also know that by saying that, what we've just done is closed off the hundreds of thousands of families who bed share that are wonderful parents that are trying to make the best choices for their children. And now they're going to come to us and not be honest with us. And that's, well, that's scary. What's scary. Yeah. 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 Because then they're going to be, then they're going to say, yep, yeah, the kid's sleeping independently when no, they're falling asleep on an armchair. I want yeah. the honesty. I want to yep. know where is that baby sleeping? And, you know, when I, I asked you like how you approach this and I'm curious what you do. When I ask a family about sleep, I ask, what I usually say is, do you have any concerns about how your child's sleeping? Do you have any questions? Rather than saying, is your child sleeping through the night, right? And then they say, oh, you know, he's waking up like every four hours. But then I ask, like, I do ask about, are you getting any stretches of sleep? Because to mm -hmm. me, if a baby is waking up every hour, past the age of like two, three weeks, yeah. there's an issue there because either yeah. that you're, there's either an issue that you are confusing sleepy cues for hunger cues. Mm -hmm. And now the baby's getting fed when they're actually sleepy, or is there some sort of medical issue we're missing? So right. maybe they, back, they do yeah. want to be fed that often, which makes you think about like milk transfer and yes. like effective yes. feeding, right? Yes. Like, well, so I always ask about sleep. I know that yeah. uh, a lot of the audience was like, I wish my pediatrician wouldn't ask about sleep, but I think sleep matters for your entire health. Yes. And the data shows that it, it matters for immunity. It matters for development. It matters. Mm -hmm. Like sleep is, is very important. And so usually I, I leave it pretty open ended and I say something kind of like, tell me about how sleep is going. Yeah. Um, and that invites the parent to say as much or as little yes. as they want, but it also helps me make sure that there's nothing that's like a glaring red flag that we would need to talk about. And I think you, we said it already. I think a family hits the jackpot when they can find a pediatrician who is open to this, is what we described mm -hmm. about, understands how connected sleep, mental health, eating, yeah. and behavior are. But you, the reality is lactation consultants alone don't know that. Sleep consultants alone don't know that. But you know who does? A pediatrician like you and me who are getting trained in lactation education yep. and understand the nuance of sleep. I'm not asking every family to cry it out. I'm not asking every mm -mm. family to do fervor if they're not comfortable. But what I what is important is knowing that there are options to extend sleep. Yeah. We don't have to. And the problem with a lot of these accounts is that they're saying, you know what, in the first year, just get used to the fact that they're going to need you. You're going to be there every every five, you know, every 20 minutes, every sleep cycle. That's actually false information, not mm -hmm. for every child, maybe not for some. every child. Yeah. But you can create some habits here that can get you the sleep if it's what you want.
You may not if want it. If that's what you want, right? Like if you're, if you are somebody that really just doesn't want that, that's totally fine. And your kid is also ultimately going to be okay. Yes. But then we've got to talk about, okay, well, that means you're not getting sleep. So how is that affecting your health and your safety? You're yes. driving around, right? You are driving that child around. You're driving yourself around. You're on the roads. Like there are other things that are happening that are important to be taking into account. And this is a, you know, I, as, as, as balanced as I am, and as, you know, I have my opinions, every family that comes into my office, we discuss the, the importance of creating independent sleep help by the age of one. And the reason I say this is not because I'm trying to be pushy or because whatever, it's because I know how important sleep is just like you, and also how important it will end up being for emotional regulation mm -hmm. as they get into those toddler years and how hard it is to teach a child who has not learned that when they get older. It's much harder to teach a two and a half year old how to oh sleep gosh. independently than it is a nine month old. Yeah. And I know this from personal and mm -hmm. professional experience. So when, and my, my families know that and they're ready. And I tell them at like the four month visit, I'm like, look, we can start talking about sleep. Let me know when you're ready. But we're, and then they, and then they think about it. And then usually my families come to me because they know by nine months, we're going to be talking about it and I'm going to give them some tips and they're happier. No family ever regrets teaching their child sleep settling, sleep teaching, sleep training skills, whatever you want to call it, ever. I've yeah. never in my whole career me neither. had a family say, Dr. Mona, how dare you teach me this? They come back and they're like, I wish I would have done that sooner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, honestly, like the other thing that really surprised me as a parent of now three kids yeah. is how different sleep can be from child to child. Yes. So like you still have to have that conversation every single time because each child is different. It, now yeah. you, the conversation may be shorter and, you know, a parent that has like two kids or three kids may have more comfort with like the, like their approaches or, or more comfort, like going with a different approach. Um, but like, each child is different. And so you cannot have a blanket. This is a best approach. Yes. And that is what I get so frustrated about with the space is that when we start to polarize education, like meaning co-sleeping, this is the best. This is what's the mm -hmm. biological norm. Okay. I, I love that you love co-sleeping. I love it. I'm happy that that's what works for you. And you've looked at the benefit and risk, but what if a family does not like co-sleeping? What if they're scared? I do not like co-sleeping. I refuse to co-sleep. So I need resources for the alternative. And mm -hmm. then on the flip side, what if a family wants to do it, right? So again, we have to understand that every kid's different. And I, I have two children, but my children are much different sleepers. Mm -hmm. Ryan, easy, man. I put him in that crib, self-settled himself. That's why, that's why I sleep trained him at two and a half months because yep. I knew he was capable and that he was already stretching nine hours. Giving yep. me an extra two hours wasn't going to be a huge lift. Vera needed so much contact. I mean, this girl, if you tried to put her on in the crib, she's like, mm -mm, mom, don't even try. <laughs> you had to hold her and rock her and do that, that slow transfer to get her the in. The ticking time bomb the ticking, kind of like, yeah, the ticking, like... <laughs> yeah. but, but through that experience, you know, I, I love that we experienced that because I, I got to see completely different children. And if I had a third, if I had a fourth, if I had a fifth, all of them are unique. And I know that mm -hmm. because of the work we do. I know that every yep. patient that walks through our door is a fun individual patient. I get mm -hmm. to get this exciting new opportunity to be like, okay, what's going on? How can yeah. we help you? And it's exciting. It's fun. It's so fun. Um, <laughs> And, and there are like strategies that we can offer and advice that we can give that aren't even like in the boat of like sleep training versus not, right? Like right. nighttime wakings, you know, they're at least with, in my family, if I, even with my two and a half year old, if he wakes up in the night and I go in, it is game over for everybody. Like he will be awake. He will not let me leave. Yes. I will not. Yes. So, so my, so my husband has to go in and I'm just like, you know what? This is what I say as a pediatrician that you have to go in. Um, and like he goes in and then, you know, he can actually settle him more effectively i think because my son knows that it won't work like yes but with me it works and so like there's little things like that little tweaks that you can make that aren't a cry it out versus not cry it out etc um they're right. just like little management tips that you can give i love it and again I, I i love that we connect on that and i hope our listeners are really resonating with this because yeah it's not that we are against what we, we're, we're, we're against is being rude to my our profession, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. And what I am against is this polarization and on both sides. And I'm not going to deny that on some pediatricians sides. do it. Um, and again, even if I know something to be safe, unsafe, using that terminology, 
it is about acceptance because I don't want a family coming in and not being forthcoming with me because that has lost trust and we need trust in every relationship. And if you're not being honest with me, I can't really help you. Um, and it's not going to, my advice is not going to go anywhere if you're not being honest with me, you know? So the other thing that I think about in terms of trust and honesty, though, is that it goes both ways. So part yeah. of like my goal with my patients is that I am going to sometimes tell you things that maybe you do not want to hear. Yes. Um, I am. And, and I need us to be able to have a dialogue about that because, yes, there are absolutely risks to bed sharing. Right. And, and if a patient mm -hmm. is talking to me about that, I'm going to be upfront with them. I'm not going to sugarcoat yeah. it because like, yes, you have to know the risks and and. You're, like you said, like a lot of people just don't appreciate that. Um, and I will talk about it, but I also want to talk about it in a context where we can have a dialogue um, right. and understand what's going on in your house. Oh, I agree. Well, we have a, a, one more thing that I want to talk about, which we could probably talk about for two episodes, is <laughs> um, pivoting to vaccines. Okay. Yes. So now I'm actually very interested because now you own your own practice. So you can speak to this working for your own practice and also for me working for a corporate um, clinical medicine practice. So uh, there's a lot of issues on social and it's overwhelming. I'm, I know mm -hmm. you agree that it's actually a huge source of anxiety for me. It's a huge source of yeah, a mental me health hit and it, it actually affects me. And I'm, I'm getting teary eyed because I've had to take a lot of step back because although I want to be a good science communicator, the amount of like anti-vax sentiment, and there's a difference between anti-vax and being vaccine hesitant. Right. Vaccine hesitancy is I have questions, doctor. Talk to me. Anti-vax yeah. is toxin, poison, poison, poison. Yeah. They're not even giving me an opportunity to teach you. Yeah. In any case, one of the big perceptions that we're going to talk about is that we make more money if we promote vaccines or are paid by big pharma to inject your children. And this is why they're pushing and they're pharma pushers. Would love to hear your perspective being a solo practice owner. And then I can offer mine as well. Oh my gosh, vaccines are so hard for me as a solo doc um, because they're impossible to get and they are so expensive. And basically, I am going to make a not even a minor loss. The two month vaccines alone cost six hundred dollars. Same right. at four months, same at six months, and I'm going to make a loss on that um, if I can get them, which is also hard to do. Uh, and even having been in a bigger practice in the past, like nobody was paying us to vaccinate kids. I vaccinate kids because I believe that that is the safest, best choice for them. Yeah. And it is what I did with my own kids. And one of my promises to like my practice, my members, my patients is I'm not going to make recommendations for you that aren't things that I would be prepared to do or have done for my own patient, for my own kids. Um, but that is just a myth. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, no big check from big farmers coming my way. You know what? You know why I get so frustrated is that I don't think people realize that pediatricians are the low general pediatricians are the lowest paid doctor of any doctor. Like, do we yep. not? Do they not realize that? Like, yeah. I, I'm I'm not talking salaries, but I make less money than I'm sure people like per hour. I make less money than what people make at Starbucks. Like I'm being yeah. quite frank. Yes. Okay? Yes. Um, and because when you think of the benefits, they get mm -hmm. better healthcare benefits. I get nothing. So uh, plus, it, you probably went into it with loans. Like right, I correct. went into it, this with like two hundred and fifty thousand yes. dollars in yes. loans. Yes. Yeah. So yes, that especially when I was paying back my my debt, I was mm -hmm. making nothing. If you yeah. think about it. Yeah. But so it frustrates me because I'm like, you would think that then if that was the case, like let's let's use logic. If I was getting paid by big pharma or my pediatrician's practice was getting paid by big pharma to push vaccines on your kid, I would not be practicing because I would be on my yacht in the middle of the Bahamas. <laughs> okay. Like I'd be, I wouldn't be practicing. I'll, I'll, I love it. I love being a doctor, even if I was wealthy, but I wouldn't like, why would I be here if I'm making money from big pharma? So from a, you know, you already said that there is a loss from our perspective. I don't know where this narrative came from, but when we see patients in our office from a clinical corporate medicine standpoint, we get paid more for preventative visits. What that means is insurance companies reimburse us more for well visits than they do for sick visits. Mm -hmm. And part of well visits are vaccines. So right. it's not that we're getting paid more because we're injecting vaccines and it's this big pharma cut that we get. It's that we're doing preventative medicine education. And the goal in any healthcare system should be putting more energy and money mm -hmm. into preventative medicine. So mm -hmm. that is why you may think that, yes, there could be more money getting paid, but it's not this sort of, oh, yeah, hey, guys, 
can you just give them extra vaccines and then we'll cut you this check? Absolutely not. I mean, ridiculous. And like you said, I would never, ever, I mean, Mm -mm. every pediatrician I know ever recommend, ever recommend something for your child that I would not recommend for my own. And so it's such a, it's such a, it's, it's, it's very defeating hearing that commentary. And of course, there's so many other anti-vax commentary that we don't get any education. We don't know how to read the inserts and all the stuff. Like they, they have a whole playbook and I would love to get my hand on this playbook so that I can like, (laughs) so I can debunk everything, but I don't have the mental energy now, but they're always coming out with some other play. Like recently, the one that's going around right now is um, at the time of this recording is why do pediatricians say that you have to introduce one food at a time, but yet they inject your baby with eight, eight vaccines scenes at a time. And I'm like, yo, 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 let's, let's backtrack here. First of all, no one's doing eight injections at a time. It's three injections, maybe mm-hmm. that it combine various things. Okay. Yep. Um, and also we don't even to get into that. I have a whole video coming about that, but they're like, they, they think that they've become so woke and lit. And I'm like, no the guys, like we're trying to keep your kids from getting sick. Like we see these illnesses, we see pertussis outbreaks, yep. we see measles outbreaks. Measles. And I mean, it's- measles right <laughs> now, right? It's terrifying. And it's, not, and it's not because of just the fact that this is all just games. We don't want to see your kids die or get really sick from these vaccine preventable illnesses. So I, yeah, I I'm going to talk to you about it. I grew up in Africa and uh, my dad was a doctor there and uh, I used to help out in his clinic and we saw people who had polio that were like paralyzed. And I just know that like, knowing the reality of what some of these diseases can look like. Um, but the other thing that scares me about like the return of these vaccine preventable illnesses is I don't know. I mean, I think I would be able to, uh, to recognize measles, but I've never seen it. Um, you know, I, I, like you said, sometimes book learning is not the same as like seeing something in person. And there is a whole like generation of pediatricians that has not seen these vaccine preventable illnesses, yeah. which has been wonderful, except for if they're coming back. And so I think that that's a recipe then for like, once we start to see outbreaks, that those outbreaks are going to spread because things are not recognized quickly enough. Um, and I'm just sort of worried about the direction that yes. health is going, that child health, preventive health is going, if this is already what we're seeing. Yeah, I've seen measles once and it was because the old practice I worked at, there were some families who delayed vaccination Mm -hmm. and there were, you know, we had policies, but some people sometimes fall through cracks, right? Right. Um, And yes, so we did see a measles case and I'll never forget it. I've also seen pertussis, which I'm not sure if you have. I've seen pertussis, yeah. I've seen seen hib meningitis two times. I've seen- cervical cancer as a meaning older children or old, like a young adult that we've had to remove her entire female organs because she had cervical cancer. So again, these are all vaccine preventable Mm -hmm. illnesses, right? And so Mm -hmm. you're never going to forget those patients. Mm -hmm. And I think one message that I always like to remind anyone listening, I, I don't think people realize that as pediatricians, we're also not only are we getting recommendations from the CDC and AAP, but we are not robots. What I mean by that is we get recommendations, right? We see what's going on, whether it's the COVID vaccine, flu vaccine. We also talk to our families and mm-hmm. then we administer these vaccines. And then part of my job, every time a family comes back, how did your child do with the vaccines? Mm-hmm. Did they have a fever? What side effects did they have? This is my own diligence in confirming that there's vaccine safety. I know that they're safe and the benefits outweigh the risks, but I am doing my due diligence to make sure that there's communication. Hey, did your child have any reaction? Because we know that vaccines are in a sense medication, right? Meaning they're not completely free of side effects. And nothing is free. Like like, nothing is like completely risk-free, but the benefits outweigh the risks. I think so in my practice, um, uh, one of the things I really love that I'm able to do now is that I have um, a texting app it's yeah. HIPAA compliant. And so I can like text my patients the day after a, a vaccine and I do, and I say, how do they do? Yeah. You know, uh, just the, it, or if something comes up, they can just text me. Oh, and I think it. that that being able to have that access, um, makes everybody, gives everyone peace of mind, me and the parents. You're making me want to like stop this recording and just start my practice tomorrow. <laughs> I will help you. It is the best. I, I, I tell you this week, I, yesterday I Man. went home and I said to my husband, I feel like I am finally like making a meaningful Aww. difference with every patient I see. I mean, I was in tears yeah, because like yeah. the patients I've seen this week and there's so few, but 
the patients that I've seen this week, I have made a meaningful difference for. And Gosh. for at least the one yesterday, tr- changed the trajectory of her health. And like, it, I was like in tears because it just like it is so Beautiful. satisfying. Ugh. Now, am well, I going to make a lot of money doing yeah. this? Absolutely not. I'm Probably not, like but covering yes, my own head. But you yes, know, yes. <laughs> I'm but you're, a you're, great time. you're getting right. You're obviously you're doing your the integrity's there, and that's exactly yeah. what I love. Well, okay. So I guess my final message would be knowing what we just talked about. Um, if a family's feeling unseen, frustrated, whatever it may be with their pediatricians, what would you say to that family? How can they approach it? Um, or maybe what should they have ready to talk to their pediatrician about when they go into visits? You know, you're, you're like this as well. I know that you believe in this, but I'm a big believer in assuming positive intent um, mm-hmm. and starting off any conversation with the expectation that the person that you're talking to has a positive, wants to help. Um, yes. You know, it, when you start off like aggressive and antagonistic for any conversation, whether it's like in your house with your kids, with your spouse, with like, you know, someone like out in the world, um, like you're never going to make as much headway as if you can sit and like understand a little bit what their perspective is. And that having that attitude makes for a more productive, meaningful conversation. Um, it, pro- I do recommend coming in with talking points or like a list of questions. Um, and being honest, if like you don't agree with something, but being honest respectfully and you should expect the same back. Yeah. Yeah. What do you I think? think? Oh, yeah. Respect. Like, I, I just had a, a post that I had done earlier this year about, like, respect, c- respect, connection, and trust, right? I mean, that is yeah. important in any relationship, right? Mm-hmm. Not only with the parent-child, but with yeah. um, maybe your partner and also definitely with um, a pediatrician, right? It's it's a relationship. And hopefully this person's going to be with you until your child's 21 mm-hmm. years old. I mean, that's a huge person in your child's life. So I don't take this relationship lightly. I I have a a lot of pride in the role that I do. I know that I'm part of this person's family and I become part of their family. And um, I think that's really important. And yeah, I love that. You know, there's that saying that you have to connect before you correct. Like when we're connecting, like for example, the bed sharing, right? I, you know, I see why this is something really important for you and I can see that. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure you love the closeness and I just want to remind you that you're doing Mm -hmm. amazing things and I just want to go over some benefits and risks of the situation, you know, and I, I do a lot of that. And sadly in corporate medicine, I don't have the time always, you know? So like you said, you feel the happiest you felt. I feel happy because I have Pete's doc talk, like Pete's doc talk gives me the ability to share all of this information on podcasts and YouTube and all of that. But in a clinical standpoint, I'm sad. I'm struggling. Like I go to work and when I go to work, I go home and I cry. And, and in, a, I, in a good way, yeah. not in a good way like you do. Okay. Like, no, and, um, but I used to do it. I used to yes. do it just like that. I would work. I was only working three days a week for a long time after I had kids, but like it would take me a day to recover from each work yeah. day because uh, I was so like exhausted and burnt out. And so like I'm working more hours now, but like I just don't have that feeling anymore. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, I, I only work one day a week clinically. Everything else is admin and Pete's doc talk. And even then I'm like, I, I come home and I'm just a zombie because I'm mm-hmm. like, I, I, like you said, I feel like I'm not able to have the full time because of just, again, insurance, logistics and all yep. of that, having to see so many patients to just even meet an overhead because big pharma checks are not coming y'all. So, uh-uh. in order for us, so in order for us to even make even and pay our employees and not even that much, by the way, sadly, that's why we can't hire employees because they can get paid more in mm-hmm. retail than as anything re- else. Yeah. Anything else like then being an MA in an office it, it becomes a huge thing so you know I think communication connection is key I think having a list is always helpful and then the last thing which I know we've spoken to and alluded to is if you're not feeling seen if you're not feeling heard mm-hmm. communicate that I really appreciate you but I feel like you're not listening or yeah. understanding what I'm saying and if you're not feeling that switching providers and it's not okay. feeling bad. I don't know why people feel so bad. I don't feel bad. Like if someone doesn't get along with me and and I, if it's a repetitive thing, like if I'm losing patients left and right, then of course I'm going to question it. Yeah. But if I'm not, so if, but if you don't like me for whatever reason, or if I don't mesh well with your parenting style, then find somebody else. But yeah. I don't want you to feel that you're stuck in this relationship. It is a relationship. And it is. You should never feel bullied. You should never feel unseen. So like you would with any partner, you should want to enjoy seeing your pediatrician, in my opinion. You should I dread agree. that person. You should not dread way. it. Yeah. You should not dread it. Like it should be like a jolly time. Yeah. Um, 
No, uh, I think sometimes I hear from patients that like are trying to switch like pediatricians within the same practice and they feel really bad about it. But I think most pediatricians understand like I have a personality. Like there are people I will click with and there are people that I will not click with. And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with me or anything wrong with them. It's just like we didn't gel for whatever reason. And that's okay. Like I don't take it personally if somebody recognizes that and like moves to somebody else because my goal ultimately is for their child to thrive. And if so, if their child will thrive with a different pediatrician, that's fine. Yes. But it's so interesting. Some going back to this, I think one message I have for any pediatricians listening is we got to let go of the ego. I think there's yes. a lot of ego in medicine and that includes this. If someone doesn't like you, let it go. It's okay. Stop. It's okay. Obviously, like I said, if it's a repetitive thing, you need to do some soul searching as to why that's happening. And then number two is staying open to learning other perspective. And I think all of us could do better at that, whether we're pediatricians, sleep consultants, speech therapists, I don't care. We just need to be better at listening and looking at other people's opinions. It doesn't mean that we have to accept Assume that positive opinion. intent. Yeah, it's the exactly. same thing. Yes, it's so hard. Um, yeah. I love this conversation. Me I love too. chatting I feel with like you. We can just keep I love going and going. <laughs> yes, yes. I, you know, it's funny. I do like to keep my episodes under thirty, but I'm like, this is going long, and it's going to be good, and I love it. And <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, you already kind of said that final message um, for everyone listening about that in, in, assume positive intent. intent. Um, where can people go to find you to stay connected if they're local to you in your area of practice? Give us all those details. Yeah, so I'm at the pediatrician mom on social media on Instagram, and my website is thepediatricianmom.com. And then my practice, I'm in Northern Virginia and accepting new patients, and it's Warm Heart Pediatrics. And actually, like uh, in the front page, I talk a lot about like my vision of what a, an ideal pediatrician patient relationship should look like. So if people are like, you know, I'm wondering what that should look like, even if you're not local to the area, I think that actually might be like a good piece of reading um, to take with you as you start. To looking at pediatricians. Oh, I will be attaching all of this to the show notes, everybody. So again, her Instagram handle, her website, and all of those resources that she mentioned. And thanks again for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in. If you love this conversation, make sure to hit that thumbs up sign, share this episode on your social media channels, and subscribe to this channel to stay up to date on all future episodes and our weekly educational videos. Have questions or comments? Make sure to comment below and I'll see you all next time. Stay well, stay loved, and keep on shining.